Yeah. Sure, man. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I okay, think we are so on the I think we're live now. Yes. Yes, we are on live. Uh, so, okay. <laughs> Thank you. So, um, well, welcome back, everyone. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce Ross Purves, who is uh, our keynote speaker today. So, uh, Ross is currently at the Department of Geography in the University of Zurich, where he works on problems that have to do with dealing with and, and representing. Um, geographic information and, and, well, descriptions of the world that involve uncertainty and, and vagueness and ambiguity. And, um, yeah, in connection with this line of work, he also frequently works on problems that have to do with um, geographical information expressed over textual documents and natural language. Okay, So I'm a big fan of this uh, line of work, and I actually think I've originally met Ross at... Um, geographic information retrieval workshop that uh, he started together with Chris Jones several years ago and that has been still going on. So I think his talk here today also addresses these issues, okay, connecting uh, ambiguous descriptions in, in natural language to landscape analysis. Okay, so Ross, thanks again for accepting our uh, invitation and, and feel free to start when, when you're ready. Okay, so hopefully you can all see the slides. Um, I can't see any of you anymore, but can you see the slides now, Bruno? Yeah, yeah, seems to be okay. working. So, um, so thanks for the introduction. Thanks uh, for inviting me. I'm very um, honoured to have been invited to, to talk about some of the work that I've been doing with lots of different people. Um, and what I'm going to try and talk about for the next 40 minutes or so, that's my aim, is, is um, what text can maybe tell us about landscape and also what it can't tell us, perhaps yet. Um, I want to do that in a number of different ways. I want to sort of start off by explaining um, why um, I think text might be an interesting source to find out about landscape and also what the societal and the scientific needs for information about landscape actually are. Because I think if we're doing any form of data science, then actually having research questions is really crucial. And I want to think a bit about what the sorts of research questions we can ask of these sorts of data are. And maybe um, linking back to the start of the symposium yesterday, some of the research questions I'll talk about are very much inspired by, for instance, some of the work that um, David David Mark did on, on naive geography and on um, ethnophysiography and things like that. So I'll make maybe some links to some things that were talked about yesterday. I want to talk a little bit about the source of data that we use, and I want to make the argument that sometimes uh, less data is better because, in fact, it turns out to be really important that we understand these data in depth and that we also uh, annotate them. I'll show you some examples of some things that we've actually done um, where we've tried to extract information from text. And I'll talk a little bit about what works and also what, what doesn't work. And I'm going to maybe finish off by trying to make the claim that I think if we're if we're going to work on these sort of methods, we should actually be thinking a bit harder about questions and a bit less just about the methods themselves. Given all that, um, it's maybe important to say that this is joint work with lots of colleagues. Um, so Elise, Manu, Olga, Asfa, Johanna, Julia, Florina, we're all involved in this work. But everything you don't ag agree with is uh, is down to me. And so I want to I want to start off by um, maybe getting you all just to to close your eyes and to think of somewhere special. I just want you to do that for a moment or two, to think of somewhere that's that's special to you in some way. And when you did that, maybe you imagined a place like this, somewhere where maybe you go with your family at the weekend and do things, and where there's lots of other families doing things. You probably didn't think of somewhere like this, um, where I come from in the rain, um, a pretty sort of miserable looking place in the autumn. But maybe, I don't know, maybe you did think of somewhere sort of classically beautiful, a sort of wonderfully um, pristine winter landscape in Switzerland. And when you thought of those places, maybe you didn't just see things in your head. Maybe you heard the children playing or you felt the rain or you were inspired by the mountains. Yeah. So I'm kind of interested in these sorts of ideas because 
they're quite important as a starting point for what I want to talk about today. So I want to kind of explain what this has to do with text on the one hand and what it has to do with landscape on the other hand. And I want to um, bring in a few sources to sort of uh, situate what I'm talking about. And the first source is a very important one. It's the European Landscape Convention that Switzerland has signed up to um, and many other European countries have signed up to. And by signing up to this convention, these countries um, agree that they'll monitor landscapes and they'll take action to protect landscapes in different ways. And one of the very important things, obviously, in the, in the landscape convention, then, is a definition of what landscape is. So perhaps unlike place, um, from the start, landscape is, is defined in a legal document. And in the European Landscape Convention, landscape is defined as an area perceived by people whose character is a result of the action and interaction of natural and or human factors. And this definition is really important because it contains quite a lot of things that matter. So first of all, the definition isn't specific about what sort of landscapes. In fact, it incorporates every, everywhere, yeah? So um, when, we, when we talk in the European Landscape Convention about a landscape, we're not talking only about classic, beautiful, aesthetically pleasing landscapes. We're talking about everything. Secondly, at the center of the definition is perception. So landscapes are literally in the eye or the ear or, the, or even the nose of the beholder. And very importantly, their character, their form, is described here as being the result of the in action and interaction of both natural and or human factors. So people are very much part of the definition. And then Johnson and Hoon, who to some extent inspired, I think, some of the work um, that David Mark did on ethnophysiography, they talked about landscape as being not a mere substrate or a bundle of actual or potential resources, but something that has a framework of deep meaning. And that's really important because um, when Johnson and Hoon talk about landscape, they really emphasize the importance of, the, of meaning. So it's, it's more than just the physical stuff that's there. And these two definitions very quickly bring us to language. They, they, they make it obvious that language kind of is going to matter in any enterprise where we're actually interested in this sort of thing. And that brings me nicely um, to um, Barry Smith and, and David Mark's work where they said, okay, well, people from different language groups and cultures have different ways of conceptualizing landscape. And we can see that um, because there's evidence for it, for instance, in different terminology. So different words we use to describe similar looking features in the landscape in different cultures, or the fact that some landscape features are described in some cultures and in others not, and the fact that things are named in in different ways in different cultures. And I want to kind of show two examples of this, again, to, to kind of make this point, to emphasize this point a bit. Um, and the first one is maybe a bit more of the, the classical sort of thing we're all used to when people start, start to talk about these ideas about differences between language groups and cultures. So um, this is a colleague here, Nicholas Burenholt, who's um, a linguist. He's a field linguist, and he belongs to the the relativist school of linguistics, um, so not the universal um, school of linguistics. And this is him with one of his informants. So this is, this um, man is a member of the Jahai, who are a hunter-gatherer tribe. And Nicholas has done a lot of work um, with the Jahai, um, first of all, writing a grammar of their language and then working on lots of other things. And I've done some work with Nicholas looking at, at the sorts of data that he's collected. And one of the really th interesting things about the Jahai is how they go about actually um, understanding, in inverted commas, um, and naming their world. So what they actually do, or, or the way they explain the world to Nicholas, is that basically um, they're walking on the backs of giants who are called the Chanel, and the Chanel are lying on the ground. And the Chanel basically lie along the water courses. So if there's running water, that's where their bodies are. And then if you have a canal lying along one water course, then his or her children are the water courses that flow into that, that water course. And we did some work, um, so Julia Vila did some work uh, looking at data that Nicholas had collected. And what's really important, so actually here are these little things, these are actually the, the names in Jahai of all these giants that are lying on the ground. And up here, what you can see so is a family tree. 
Okay, so this is the family tree of these giants. So this is the, the grandfather and then the children um, and then the grandchildren of this grandfather. And this structure is replicated actually if if we look at Strahler ordering, we can re we can we can rebuild this structure. Um, and what's very interesting about it is that these names are basically opaque. They're they're literally just names, so they don't have any meaning. They're not referring to landscape features or anything. And so what the Jahai seem to be doing is they seem to be using a cognitive system where they're storing information about space using names and actually using a family tree to organize it. Yeah. So. And if you think about it, that's a very different way of using names to what we do, but it seems to be quite effective. And, and you have to understand as well, you can see in the background of this picture of Nicholas, actually. So this, this is sort of dense rainforest. You can't see very much. Um, and the, this is an oral tradition. And so they're organizing information about these places, about this landscape, entirely through language and through a very different way to what you're used to. The second example um, is a European example. Um, and this is actually looking at free listing experiments. So basically in these experiments, what we, what we did is we asked people uh, to list um, words that they associated with landscape. And then we looked at the order of the lists and the relationship between terms in the lists. And the really important thing um, is, so we were looking here at languages actually that use the European Lands Landscape Convention, because what we're interested in is um, how similar is the concept that people um, think about when they think about landscape in these different languages? And what turns out is, first of all, um, so these networks you can see, um, you can see basically relationships between terms. So you can see in English, for instance, mountain and hill, and then tree and grass across across here. And hill is related to field and so on. Um, or if I go across to German, you can also see berg and hugel. So the same thing that we saw there, and then visa, so, so a meadow instead of a field, a little bit different, there's a field actually. And then you can say flus and say, so river and lake. So some similar things, and then there are other things that are different. So if we go um, down to French, you have this very strong relationship between montagne and mer, so between mountain and, and sea. And so what we actually see here is that the ways that people seem to be conceptualizing landscape vary between these land languages. They're not the same. And actually, very interestingly, so in Swedish, this wasn't an intended effect, but it shows nicely how these networks actually are capturing this. So down here are landscape terms, as we have in the other things. And up here are actually the names of regions in Sweden, which are which is just an ambiguity in Swedish. When you ask people about, I think, landscap, I don't speak Swedish, but I think that's it. Then they also, they can do one of two things it's because it's an ambiguous question. They can either list the names of these regions or they can list those landscape terms like they did in the other languages. So this kind of shows, um, I hope, that if we start to explore lang language, we can start also to find out about landscape in different ways. And this is then relevant to policy. That's a, a really important part of what I want to say. And I want to kind of show you why it's relevant to policy. And I want to do that by talking a little bit about what are called cultural ecosystem services. So um, I, hope, I hope most of you or many of you have come across the idea of ecosystem services. That ecosystem services is basically a way of thinking about ecosystems and quantifying and valuing ecosystems. And cultural ecosystem services are what are often uh, described as being indirect, uh, immaterial benefits to people. So for instance, that a landscape is aesthetically pleasing or that we go and recreate, we go and mountain bike or, or that we go um, and find tranquility in a landscape. These are, these are what are called cultural ecosystem services. And these are important, first of all, because we more directly experience and appreciate them than for instance, um, regulating services, so for the capacity of trees um, to, um, to, to cool down an urban landscape. We don't experience that ourselves so directly, these cultural things we do. And so they're seen as being very important for making people aware in general of the importance of ecosystems. But it turns out it's been rather hard to do this. So um, Diaz in a very well-known uh, paper in Science said the unpacking and valuation of these cultural ecosystem services that are not so amenable to biophysical or monetary metrics has lagged behind. And that meant that um, they're mainstreaming into policy. So considering these in policy has kind of lagged behind. 
And if we go back um, to the Millennium Assessment and then Hulan et al. Um, sort of did this representation of these cultural ecosystem services that we can see here. Um, you can see a bunch of things that we can kind of relate to our picture at the start. So, you know, up here, maybe we've got um, people who are very obviously taking part in recreation. Um, down here, it's maybe more about sense of place and social relationships. When I think about this place, it's a particular place in Scotland and particular weather and particular people. Um, across here, perhaps this picture, we're thinking more about aesthetic values or inspiration. And then if we think about the Jahai, um, then we have knowledge systems and spiritual and religious values in the sense of these, these, these giants that are actually the, their creation story of the world. So having said all that, now I want to take you on one more journey. Um, uh, and I want to go to one of my favorite places in the world. And that place is Assent in Scotland. So this is what Assent looks like. Um, it's a very beautiful place on the northwest coast of, of Scotland. It's um, a, a landscape of hills with lots of water. It's got lots of water for a reason. It rains a lot. Um, and it's kind of interesting to think about how we can characterize um, this place. And if we look at sort of traditional spatial data, so we can go maybe and find out how, how this place would be described. So one data set um, from Seratel, so these uh, global ecological land units, which I think is a really interesting data set that basically uh, divides the world up using unique ecological areas that they call ecological land units um, based on bioclimate, landforms, rock type and land cover. Um, and you can go away and, and read about that. There's a really nice story map. And I think the session before people were talking about telling stories about data. And I think the story map about these uh, global ecological land units is a really brilliant example of that, actually. But if we go to, to Ascent, this place that I can wax quite lyrically about, then what we find is cold, wet hills on carbonate sedimentary rock with grassland shrub or scrub. Um, now, when my son saw saw that earlier on this evening, he thought cold, wet hills was quite a good description of, of Scotland. Um, but I think there's maybe a little bit more to it. So you could say, well, maybe we need to just go and look at some more local data, maybe some land cover data um, from Scotland. So here's land cover data uh, from Scotland, the UK land cover, map, land cover map from 2015. Ascent is up here. And if we zoom in, then we just find heather grassland. So it's kind of, you know, not very satisfying, I would argue. So maybe we could take another approach. And so what I want to do now, and I hope this will work, is I want to just play you a reading um, from one of my favorite authors, someone called Kathleen Jamie, who writes a lot about Scotland. Um, and this is, I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna read the text, or I hope I'm not gonna read the text. It's read by someone called Kathleen McCorran, and it's from a book called Surfacing. And this is a, a reading about Ascent. So let's just see if this works. You're sheltering in a cave, thinking, Nope. It doesn't. About the Ice Age. From the cave mouth, a West Highland landscape in spring, in the early Anthropocene. On the hillside opposite, six red deer have bedded down in the heather. It's raining, a soft Highland rain, a smur. Not half an hour ago, you were walking beside the burn in a narrow ravine further up the glen. You heard something, glanced up to see a large rock bounce, then plummet into the burn 25 yards in front of you. The echo faded, but your heart was still hammering as you backed away. They call these caves the bone caves because of all the animal bones found buried inside, animals long extinct in this country. You're in reindeer cave where antlers rather than bones were discovered. An excavation in the 1920s produced hundreds of reindeer antlers, almost all from females. You sit at the cave mouth, looking out at the rain, thinking about the Ice Age. You realise you haven't a clue. We can wait, say the hills. Take your time. So I hope you hear, so no, nobody's said anything. I hope you're all still there. It's a little bit weird in this air meeting because I can't actually tell what's going on. Um, but I hope you enjoyed that and I hope it gave you a sense of the place. Yeah, it, it, 
told you something about what it was like. And what's interesting about that is it's a sort of first person description. It's a description of what Kathleen Jamie experienced when she went to this place, of the things she heard, of the things she saw, of the things she felt, of the hills metaphorically speaking to her and so on. And if we want to find out about these cultural ecosystem services, then actually a lot of information is in there. So this um, figure here shows some work uh, that Florina Bartman did, um, where we analyzed different sorts of data. So we analyzed actually free lists, a bit like in those landscape descriptions, um, hiking blogs, and Flickr tags. But we didn't analyze those in the lecture theater. Rather, we went to specific locations to analyze them. So we went to 10 different locations um, and collected data in Switzerland, actually in Swiss German. And what we then did is we compared what sorts of information were in them. So here are the Flickr tags, for instance, down at the bottom always. In the middle are the hiking blogs, so sort of the closest to that description that we just read, although typically these hiking blogs are a little bit less lyrical than that. And then at the top are the free lists, the things that people describe. And basically from here up, so the cultural, the perceptual, the activities, the sense of place and the people, these are all kind of cultural ecosystem services. The biophysical is actually the stuff that's there, and then toponyms are, are the place names. And if we go to the, the reading that you just heard, then you know we have a whole bunch of this stuff. So for instance, in terms of the people, we have someone specific. We have Kathleen Jamie who's writing about it, So and we know all sorts of things about Kathleen Jamie. Um, in terms of sense of place, we have this ancient landscape, this West Highland landscape. Smur is a, a Scottish word for rain, which at least for me has a very strong sense of place. She describes different activities. So she describes walking and sheltering and so on. She describes perception. So um, she hears an echo. She feels the soft rain. She sees the red deer. She doesn't mention, although often people would mention, so smelling deer or um, hearing deer. Um, then she talks about various things that are culturally important. So she talks about the bone caves, these caves where these reindeer bones are, the Anthropocene, so the the epoch in which we now appear to be, these archaeological excavations. She also talks about a lot of the biophysical things um, that to some extent afford some of this other stuff. So a, a burn, that's a Scottish word for a stream, for a little river. The ravine, a glen, that's a, a Gallic word for a, a valley. The cave, the red deer again. And then she also names some places. So she talks about the West Highlands and the bone caves and so on. And Actually doing this, so annotating a text like this, is typically quite an, an, an iterative process where we make multiple iterations, yeah? So, of course, the question is, and that's kind of, I guess, why I was asked to talk here, is like, can we scale this up and can we do it computationally? And I want to spend the rest of my time um, talking about that. Um, and so I'm going to talk first about some of the challenges that I see there being, then I'm going to talk about uh, two examples and maybe go into a little bit of detail. Um, and then at the end, I want to talk about some of the problems that there still are and so on. So if we want to work with text on cultural ecosystem services, but also on other things, then first of all, I would really strongly argue that we need specific research questions that have scientific and or policy relevance, typically both. Yeah. Secondly, we need to have collections that contain individual direct experiences. So what we don't want to do is we don't want to work on sort of proxy data. So for instance, there's lots of people um, done work on cultural ecosystem services where they count Flickr pictures and say um, that's a proxy for tourism. But we don't really want to do that. We want to actually um, work, for instance, on perception. And we want, when we work on perception, to use text where someone says, like Kathleen Jamie just did, um, that she heard the rock bouncing down the hill and the echo, that she actually perceived that. So we don't want to just take, um, so there's other work, again, using Flickr and similar sources where, for instance, people say, well, there's a picture of a dog, so therefore you can hear dogs barking at this place. And we don't want to do that. We want to actually have these individual direct experiences where we can actually extract information about what people perceived. So we need those collections. And then, of course, we actually need methods to extract and to classify information. And so I'm going to take two examples, um, both of which I think are quite interesting and quite relevant at the moment. 
in the situation we find ourselves in. The first is tranquility, and particularly what I'm going to call experience tranquility. And the second is um, what I'm going to call everyday landscapes. So the places where we actually spend most of our time. So not when we go away to some beautiful landscape, but rather what we see when we sit and look out of the window. So why are these things relevant? Well, maybe um, first of all, tranquility is relevant because um, I think in 2001, uh, there was a, a survey done in the UK of why people went to the countryside and 54% of people said they went to experience tranquility. That's very interesting because in German it's actually quite hard to even translate it into a term. Um, so it's, it's not so clear what tranquility would really be in German and there's various people do done things for instance in Switzerland recently and my students do a project on tranquility every year and the first thing they wrestle with is what is it? And why is that interesting? Well, it's interesting because this concept, this idea, is very central to Anglo-Saxon notions of countryside. It's so important, um, and it's important because of writing about, about countryside. And so what I want to look at in the first example is where and how are sounds and silence and tranquility experienced. And I'm going to talk about two pieces of work, really, that we did. The first piece of work was using historical data, so um, uh, data about the Lake District in England, a corpus of historical writing, and comparing it to a much more contemporary corpus, so geograph, which are basically descriptions of pictures where people have written about pictures. Um, and the uh, second piece of work was actually scaling that up across the whole of the UK and comparing a, a model of tranquility based on where people wrote about it and that's why we would say it's experienced tranquility so these are places where people actually wrote about it being peaceful or quiet or tranquil and comparing that then to land cover and so on and things that people typically in theory argue are related to tranquility so i just show you some of the results and maybe say a little bit about them so so this here is actually a map of tranquil locations that we found in this historical corpus. Um, um, so Bruno's done some work with this corpus, for instance, um, and you can see there are these very, so for instance here, all was calm and still, no sound caught the ear, but that of the distant waterfalls or of the oars. Or across here, the peacefulness of these retreats is enviable and we think we should like to live out our lives in such a spot as this. And what's really important to emphasize about these data is that we used um, computational methods to identify candidate descriptions of tranquility, um, mostly by working on lexicons of terms that were associated with silence and with tranquility, then extracting sentences that contained those terms. But then we did lots of annotation. And in fact, it was very, very difficult. So we were never able, we never got good enough at the annotation to be able to do it individually. We always actually for the historical ones had to discuss them to decide what we actually thought were descriptions of tranquility or not. And why am I emphasizing that? I'm emphasizing that because I think it makes it relatively clear that that's algorithmically, if, if people need to discuss it, I don't think we're at the point where we can start training an algorithm to do that. In contrast, um, for geograph, um, for the more contemporary ones, um, Actually, we did write an algorithm, or Olga, Chesna, Olga Kobla, as she knows. Uh, so Olga wrote an algorithm um, to do this, to extract these, extract these descriptions. And you can see here um, lots of different descriptions. And what we actually have here are three different types. So what we call combination. Um, so a combination description is one where, I'm just trying to see if I can see one, um, where yeah, so for instance, this one, the early morning calm was breathtaking, a water bird decided to swim across, its tiny wake seemed to accentuate the stillness even further. So they typically include at least the idea of sound and the idea um, of, um, of stillness in terms of, of visual stillness. Then contrast is very, very common. So for instance, right by the A66, which is a busy road, but quiet nevertheless, or let's see if there's another contrast one, a purple one, number three. So a tranquil scene viewed from the not quite so tranquil A6, another road. Or up here, um, this peaceful value is popular with the military for low level flying. Um, um, 
peace is restored quickly. So, and that's very common. This idea of describing tranquility by contrast is very, very common. And what you can actually also see is that, so these red areas, this is a map of modeled tranquility, if you like. Um, and you can see that these, these places where tranquility is by contrast often seem to be associated with lower tranquility. And in fact, that is the case. So here we're actually looking at the differences and we have a statistically significant difference for these contrast tranquility values. So that was a sort of initial study where we looked at this, um, this comparison between historical and contemporary data. And then we went on to um, try and actually move this to be more relevant to policy. So not just looking at the Lake District, um, but looking at the UK as a whole. And what we did is we automatically extracted, I think about 15,000 descriptions of tranquility over the UK as a whole. And for those, those descriptions, we had locations because they're actually georeferenced these descriptions of those, these pictures in this particular case. And because they're georeferenced, then we can link them to other sorts of data. So this here is a logistic regression model. It doesn't really matter, but it's basically modeling um, tranquility. And what is important is that if we look at some of the variables, we have things like fresh water or salt water or naturalness, diversity, population, built up area, and so on. And the, the significant variables here, so fresh water and naturalness, so Water is very commonly associated in the literature with tranquility. And then naturalness, so this is basically to do with the land cover types, again, is strongly associated with tranquility. Then built up areas are negatively associated with tranquility. So the more built up it is, the less likely we are to find this tranquility. And then elevation is rather interesting. So basically what this is telling us is that as we go higher, we find less of this experienced tranquility. So if you go to the tops of the mountains, it might be tranquil, but nobody's going there and writing about it and describing it. And so the key thing here is that the, these locations of experienced tranquility sort of globally, they agree with theory. Then the other thing that's very interesting is that we can zoom in on the semantics of individual bits of this tranquility story. And if we do that, um, this is uh, these are terms associated with urban tranquility, and actually we see again a lot of this contrast. So we see things like um, let's see enclave, so or backwater. We see streets and so on, and actually these these descriptions seem to again be telling us that this this contrast that we found in the in the previous on the previous slide is really important. And so the key result here is that experienced tranquility, as we find out when people write about somewhere being tranquil, is not the same as this model of tranquility, which is based on the physical properties of the landscape. Because as you can see here too, people find quite a lot of tranquility in places that are modeled as not being tranquil. And that's because that's where people are. We don't look for, you know, if, if, there, if there's no people there, we don't find tranquility. Tranquility is an entirely human construct. You have to be there to experience it. So that's quite, a, for us, quite a nice result because it shows this the value of extracting this information from text about what people actually experience in terms of this cultural ecosystem service. The second example I want to talk about is what people value in everyday landscapes. And maybe some of you have heard about this. This is um, a project that's actually that we've done because of coronavirus, basically, because one of the PhDs in my group, so Manuel Baer, um, was working on a, a gamification approach to collecting natural language data about landscape. And the whole idea was that it was going to be a location-based game. And then along came coronavirus, and he had to do something that didn't involve sending people out to play outside when they were in lockdowns. And so he developed something called Window Expeditions, which I, maybe some of you have seen, and I'll maybe stick a link to it in the chat afterwards. Um, and the whole point of Window Expeditions was to collect descriptions from people at home of their everyday landscape. So what is it we value about where we are right now? There's a few few aspects that are important about it. Um, it's a gamified um, approach, so people get points and so on, although they don't necessarily seem to care very much. It's privacy preserving, so we actually store these um, hexagons. This is based on the H3 uh, grid, uh, 
higher hexagon thing from Uber, so indexing structure. So we only store it as hexagon. We don't actually, this is what the user would see. This is where the user actually is, but that information never is transmitted to us. All it's transmitted to us is this hexagon. So first of all, they locate themselves. Then they read this. So basically wait till the countdown's finished, take the time to take in your surroundings. What marvels can you uncover today? And then they type in a description. They agree um, that the description is publicly available and viewable. They tell us if they're at home and they give us some very basic demographics, how old they are, um, if they want their gender. And we ask them to say in which languages they believe they're very fluent. And we've got around 600 contributions so far um, all over the world, but most of them not very surprisingly in Europe and a lot of them in Switzerland, in English, in German and French. And I want to show you one example in German um, because I think it's kind of interesting because it's about Hochnebel. So the German speakers will probably know what Hochnebel is in, in, in Switzerland and in Germany in the winter. It, it can be very grey for a long time um, because of high pressure. That's something we don't really know about in Scotland. Um, and this person says, well, everybody hates this Hochnebel, um, um, the, 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 the grey lid um, the, the shield between the sun and us, it has lots of names, but I like it. And then he goes on to describe, or she goes on to describe why um, they like this Hochnebel. And these are the sorts of descriptions that we've collected. And so because we have them in multiple languages, and because we have more than 600 of them, we can do some things with them. So the first thing we can do is we can look at terms in these different languages. So these are showing um, the nouns ranked um, in English, and in German, and maybe I want to just talk about two things. So here's tree and baum, so the same glosses in English and German are basically at the top of both lists. So it turns out trees are very, very important to people um, when they're stuck at home a lot. And then here's bird in English, and you can see this arrows going away down here. So birds are much less important in German. That's also quite an interesting result for us. So we can actually extract information about these terms and how these concepts might vary between languages. We can also look at perception. Um, and this is looking at the different perceptions that we find in uh, different languages. So for instance, I always have to be very careful here. So there are 29 descriptions where um, sight and sound, but only sight and sound are found. Um, there are two where sight, smell, feel and sound are found and so on and so on. So we can all, we can look at perception. And then if we take tree as an example, we can also sort of zoom in and look a little bit more at what's described in tree because, so basically, so basically, so these are basically basic levels. Um, so they're sort of important concepts that are being used that everybody understands what they mean. And if we look here, what we've done is we've used a dependency parser to, to look at the terms that are being used to describe these trees. Um, across here are nouns, here um, are verbs, and around here are adjectives. And what we can see is that very commonly, for example, people specify types of trees. So cherry tree, chestnut tree, oak tree, palm tree, pine tree, and so on. So that tells us something about the way that they characterize them. We can see what sort of shapes they have. They're tall or they're small. They're leafless, they're green, they're evergreen, they're big, they're beautiful, and so on. Yeah, so we can start to understand what it is, and that was the question I had, um, that people value about these trees. So you're sort of thinking um, that I said perhaps that I'd say something about problems, and I want to say a little bit about that, about some of the challenges that we find with these methods. Um, so I've got sort of four here. The first one is quite an interesting thing to look at the similarity between documents. And there was a, a talk earlier on today, I think, where someone was talking about word to vec or BERT, these sorts of methods. Um, the problem with those for our data is that they're typically trained on very different corpora. And then when we use out of the box methods um, to look at similarity, then they don't do a very good job at doing document similarity. So we need actually to train on more landscape-like data. And we have the same problem if we try and use sentiment analysis. So we've done some work with sentiment analysis, but there are big issues, again, because of the domain, because typical sentiment analysis approaches are not trained on landscape. They're trained on very different things. Um, 
and because of the lexicons. And we've tried to extend that, but I, I don't think we've been very successful. Then georeferencing, so how do we actually link these descriptions to space? If we go back very quickly to um, these descriptions, these are linked based on toponyms, based on typical sort of toponym um, recognition and resolution approaches that people that work on text are familiar with. But those approaches are not really up to the job because um, they don't pay any attention to context in terms of the sorts of things that are being talked about. Are those things big or small? Um, the gazetteers often don't deal with extended features. And also, we haven't really paid enough attention to what I would call toponym geography. So like, what sorts of things are named? How are they named? How does ambiguity work? And so on. And then a very important issue that kind of links a bit, I think, to the last session as well, is we're a bit limited in the way we can actually visualize these results of text-based methods. I, I think that's a very challenging problem. Um, and you saw that my visualizations are not necessarily um, so beautiful, but um, I think there's a lot to do there still. So I want to kind of say something now about the title of the talk. So what text can tell us about landscape and what can't it um, yet? So I hope I've showed you that we can extract, we can classify, we can count, and we can compare descriptions, describe individual perception, and we can do most of that pretty automatically. Um, we can also uh, look at the characterization of basic levels, so our trees and birds and so on, and that takes us to something called revealed preferences, which are important in landscape research in these everyday landscapes. What we're still working on and what's still quite challenging is automatically extracting and counting these cultural ecosystem services as opposed to the perception, which we can do. We're working on building domain lexicons to model sentiment and then these revealed preferences more effectively. And we need to do more work about um, the georeferencing, about linking concepts with space appropriately across scales. So I want to kind of finish with, if I may, a few take home messages that I think are important. So first of all, I think that's been said quite a lot at this symposium, theory matters. Um, I think we really need to look at theory. And when we talk about theory here, we're talking about theory, for instance, about landscape, and we're talking about theory about language. And we're also talking about theory about um, geographic information science. Yeah? Um, secondly, text is a proxy for language. So we're using text as a proxy for natural language about, about these, these places. I hope I've shown you why I think small domain specific corpora are really powerful because we can annotate them in very detailed ways and we can do what Yorkers called micro reading very effectively. Other people have called that close reading. I would argue that the basic NLP methods are actually very capable for lots of the things that we're interested in and that small improvements in precision and recall are not really relevant to our tasks. And that we need to be careful and I'm a big fan of Emily Bender's work, if people are familiar with her, a sort of computational linguist. We need to be careful um, when we try to generalize, and we also sh often shouldn't generalize, between languages, but also between domains. So there's a very nice paper just come out about machine learning and about um, state-of-the-art benchmarks and so on. And I think that's also very important for the work we're doing. So I want to finish with a nice picture and thank you all for listening. Um, and I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Okay, so uh, thanks a lot. Um, so I would ask people to either leave questions on the Q&A or on the general panel. Oh, okay, I think we have one. Um, and also, if you want to, uh, well, ask the questions live and come to the stage, uh, let me know. I guess you can raise the virtual hand and I'll try to promote you to, to a participant here on, on, on the, um, well, on, on, on the panel. So, um, so regarding this first question, I think Eric was asking, have you considered the presence of these keywords in negated sentences? So you were trying to map keywords, I guess, to types of perception, right? And yeah. uh, I guess the question refers to uh, uh, whether you take care of uh, handling negation patterns and things like this, right? That can reverse the meaning yeah, so, of what the sentence is saying. Yeah, so, uh, so I guess I can say two things about that. Um, in the historical text, like I said, we annotated those by hand. Yeah, so we did that by hand, um, and therefore 
we didn't just look at keywords. What we did is actually we extracted candidate sentences and then we we dealt um, with those um, negated things by reading them. And then when we did it algorithmically, so on the more contemporary data, we trained algorithms and the we the performance of the algorithm so basically takes it that into account. The so we used a random forest, in fact, and it performs quite well. I can't remember. I don't know the number of precision and recall off the top of my head, but the performance is pretty good for those things. Okay, so uh, I think uh, Jan had another question, right? So um, big lessons, right, that can generalize from this work to to spatial data science uh, in general. Uh, do you have some ideas about this? Yeah, so um, I think. So I guess I didn't say that, but I think not working in isolation. So I work with linguists and I work with people who work on landscape. Um, and we, so then the question, so the, the questions are driving the work, not the methods. Um, and I quite strongly feel that that's a more effective way to move forward because you know for instance if 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 we look actually so i i said to you bruno i think that, that i'd I, I quite like the paper that you've just had with uh, ludovic monkla and, and i've forgotten the other person's name about toponym recognition and resolution yeah. because i think it addresses some of the issues um and but i think all these pieces of work they need to be put in a context you know so and if we don't put them in a context, then what does it mean? So, so I, I guess that would be, I think the most important thing would be to put stuff in a context and not to do it on our own. So um, let me see here. So maybe a new question from Yano as well. Let me see if I can put this here. Uh, okay. so scale issues right so um scale of human experience with respect to place uh... yeah so that's i i guess that question can be related um to what i said about the the issue with linking um to locations so for instance if someone describes a location as being tranquil and that location is is a loch a lake um then you know probably the tranquility can be found at many places on that loch but if somebody describes a, a, a quiet peaceful place that's near a busy road then maybe it's a little location that's screened by trees and i think exactly that this is exactly one of the challenges that i think is very interesting and i think we've not really scratched the surface of that so um obviously what we're doing so cultural ecosystem services are only about human experience that's really important and then linking those human experiences and the affordances that the larger geographic features give and thinking about what that means about the scale at which the experience occurs is really is is, is a very very challenging thing i think but i think it's also a very interesting question so i guess still connected to this idea of scale here so so in in your talk on the one hand well you talked about computational methods and i guess scaling up to the analysis of more data but yeah. you also emphasize the importance of uh well keeping your hands on the data as well and doing micro reading and uh, yeah. having a sense of the actual data that you're using so so what's the trade-off here i mean at, at which point do you say that your results are i don't know significant and statistically significant and you have a sufficiently large sample for these patterns to emerge right and what what at what point does this become now unmanageable in the sense that you need to trust these automated methods because you can no longer control the data that's a really interesting question so um i think think rather than maybe rather than just thinking about scale we should also think about um about generalizability and i think as soon as we change the corpus for example so the 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 tranquility study that i showed you we first did it for the lake district and then we did more or less everything by hand 
and then we trained an algorithm and then we ran the algorithm on the same corpus on the same language but across the whole of the uk and i think that's kind of a justifiable approach but if i go and those are those are these descriptions of pictures yeah um um if i then though go and take a very different domain and start saying well i can extract descriptions of, of peaceful locations then i think we have to repeat that whole process mm -hmm. so and, and in that and study, I, I think the, the geograph pictures, well, the annotations there were, were made with a purpose, right? So it's very different, I guess, from Flickr in the sense that people were instructed on the yeah. types of descriptions that they should provide in connection to those pictures. Right? Well, they're, they're moderated and they're kind of, yeah, they're kind of a little bit. So there's a, quite a lot of variation in how people do it, but they're a very clear genre of, of description. Yeah, so you couldn't. So, so actually, Florina has done some work on Flickr looking at tranquility, but it's quite different, I would have said. Um, it's much more actually inferred tranquility. It's not so explicit a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. So we have another one here, Grant McKenzie. So, um, well, I guess he's uh, asking about connections to affordances and affordances of places, right? So how does tranquility uh, connect with this um, notion of the affordances of a place? Um, so I guess I think that's also quite an interesting question because to some extent, a little bit the problem, so that's also what you really see in the data. People find tranquility in all sorts of places that you wouldn't expect it um, because they, they look for it, they need it. Um, and then when we look for this experienced tranquility, we were actually quite surprised by some of the locations where people were describing it. So to what extent we can, we can really, yeah, I think maybe you could actually almost turn it around and say, say what it's actually, it's, it's kind of to do with people and how people interact with places that gives them then the affordance of having tranquility rather than the properties of the place in and of itself. That seems to be, that's kind of what we see in these in these language data. Um, I mean, it's also maybe, maybe just to sort of put it a little bit in a historical context. So, you know, Wordsworth who wrote in the Lake District about all this peace and things. So what he did was he, he basically, he would be standing with his back to some noisy industry where they were mining and things, and he just kind of closed his ears and didn't look that way and then wrote about what he liked. And I think that also, you know, tells us something about how we experience the world. Um, mm -hmm. And about preferences, yeah. 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 Okay, so uh, um, I guess by the end of your talk, we discussed so, some of these limitations in current methods. And you mentioned these limitations in connection with assessing similarity, right, between documents. So you said something like these generalistic models don't really fit here in the sense that they, they don't capture the type of, let's say, similarity relations that we would be interested in looking. Yeah, when, so I mean, when analyzing yeah. these descriptions, right? Yeah. Uh, I guess, sure. So you can use these similarity relations to attempt to infer things about these documents, attempt to infer types of perception. But I mean, would it be reasonable to expect models to do this? I mean, what does it mean to be similar in this case? So, well, maybe I could give an example and then it, so that would explain a little bit better what I mean. Um, so, for example, in, in this the the study I talked about very briefly where, where I talked about Kathleen Jamie's text and we had these different perceptions and the, the underlying study that we did, we collected descriptions of 10 different landscapes of five types. And then what we wanted to do was to see how similar or how different um, landscapes were as a function of type, yeah, and um, that basically only worked for biophysical things. When when we looked at the biophysical terms that people use to describe it, so like mountain and river and so on, then we found quite a lot of we could actually distinguish between the landscape types. But when we looked at sense of place and so on, then what we found was that the same things were everywhere. Okay, but we did that using a sort of lexicon-based approach and cosine similarity. 
And what we've been trying a bit to do recently is then, because of course the problem with that is that you you don't have any way of linking between terms that mean similar things, yeah? Mm -hmm. And if you use word to vec or bear or whatever, then you can actually have a model of the, the, the space. But when we try and use those methods, because they are not trained on landscape data, mm -hmm then basically, you know, everything's kind of similar. And it, so we need to actually train, we basically need to train something on a big enough landscape corpus to get these similarities about terms mm -hmm. and landscapes mm -hmm. to do the similarity thing. But, but uh, I guess there are lots of challenges in collecting that type of data, right? Because again, these perceptions are going to be depending on culture, on individuals, right? So, so you, again, uh, on the one hand, you will attempt to collect data that tells you if things are similar in a way that um, avoids these uh, particular properties associated with individuals and culture and things like this that make these descriptions going to be a bit different, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's why I think it's a challenging because it's the sort of computational thing that everybody wants to do. They're like, oh, let's take bear and do mm -hmm. similarity. But yeah, and so the best results we've had are just using very simple lexicons where we actually know about, you know, what the terms are that we're extracting and, and so on. But obviously that's very laborious. Mm -hmm. So we have another interesting question from Jano here. So how do we model these soft attributes, like places where tranquility can be experienced, right? So there aren't, there aren't crisp boundaries for this. So what types of methods we use to to well to delimit these places and to model these places right? so maybe i answer the last bit first about time so in in the tranquility descriptions we find lots of time so they so they clearly do vary in time so people talk about tranquility for instance being in the morning that's one of the things we extracted from the corpus so we i think we had four classes of things and one was about time um and then um Another thing that we extracted were the sorts of places. So people talk about, you know, tranquil spots and tranquil places. So we can actually extract from the linguistic data some notion of what these, you know, so when people talk about a tranquil spot, that kind of implies somewhere that's not very large, but it also tells you that it's not a point in space. Um, so I think... So I, I, I personally would argue we can computationally model these things by, by looking at the language that's used and we don't need to represent them geometrically in, in that sense at all. Um, but mm -hmm. I think there's still lots to do. And yeah, they definitely don't have crisp borders. Mm -hmm. And the issues of, well, variations in time are also quite interesting. I haven't thought about that. but And they raise challenges in the sense that for doing this sort of analysis with the uh, let's say the historical corpora, for instance, well, uh, capturing time is again going to be very challenging. Maybe with the photos, it's a bit easier, but uh, yeah, there are lots of interesting possibilities there as well. Okay, so yet another one, uh, let me see here. So the relationship between landscape and, and languages, right? So, uh, yeah, so this is, is a chicken and egg <laughs> kind of thing. <laughs> Yeah, and it's a very, so, I mean, because this is effectively environmental determinism, which uh, linguists don't like at all. Um, um, so I guess I would, I mean, I've worked with these relativist linguists, yeah, and they would just kind of say, well, there's lots of different ways people categorize the world and exactly how people do that. Um, it's, it's certainly the idea that, you know, for instance, the Jahai are using these, these canal, these giants that are lying on the ground and that's somehow determined by the environment, I think is rather unlikely. I would, I prefer to think there's lots of different ways that you might think of naming the world and they've chosen one that's cognitively efficient. And whether, how, how that relates to the environment, I, I, I would be quite careful about. Um, hmm. Well, well, um... Yeah, I think we're more or less on time. So um, thanks again for the very interesting keynote. I would yeah, suggest everyone to aggressively click on the clap uh, button at the bottom. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, so I guess um, I guess this is it, right? So we're having a short break now and uh, and then we'll return for, for another session. Okay, so thanks.
thanks again and, and see you in a couple of minutes. Thanks for asking me. Okay. Bye-bye.